Uh, at this time, we're going to dismiss the children for Children's Church. Uh, and we're going to sing the song, Here We Are But Straying Pilgrims. And what, let's just stand again. It's easy for the kids to get out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are but straying pilgrims. Here our path is often dim. But to cheer us on our journey still, we sing this wayside hymn. Yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our homes forever and the smile of the blessed gift gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our feet are often weary on the hills that throng our way. Here the tempest darkly gathers, but our hearts within us say, Yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise, soon will be our home forever and of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our souls are often fearful of the pilgrims lurking foe, but the Lord is our defender and he tells us we may know yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansions rise soon will be our home forever and the smile of the blessed gift gladdens all longing eyes jerry Good morning, church. Good morning. I uh, want to start out. We've got some visitors, so I want to let them know for sure I'm not the normal preacher. So even if you uh, are disappointed here today, please come back and uh, hear Tim, our, uh, our, our minister, who does an outstanding job. I, for one, think he gets better and better each and every Sunday. His recent lessons have been outstanding. And um, I have a new appreciation for him because I taught class this morning and I also uh, worked on a lesson. So um, there was a lot of preparation that went into this week, a lot of time commitment. And he does it week in and week out and he does it really well. Amen. <clears throat> this lesson today is going to be what I would call a little bit personal. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my childhood, a little bit about my background, and a little bit about one of my struggles. As a child growing up, I grew up in a small denomination. It was called the Evangelical United Brethren, or EUB for short. And it was a very small denomination, and I believe it was very Bible focused. And I'm thankful that in my very early years, I did receive some good Bible training. And I was even going to mention the fact that um, I have this picture here of this really cute sixth grader in his robe um, as he is graduating from confirmation class. 
So if you want to see that later, I'll be unhappy to show it to you. So, um, and the other thing I always say about that um, denomination is if you've ever sat by me and you realize just how poorly I sing, how bad I, I, you know, I sing off key, it's because of this small um, denomination. Because they pounded on this huge pipe organ so loud, I never really did hear myself sing. So when you sit by me, you can have compassion. When I, shortly after that picture was taken, and I was probably in about seventh or eighth grade, this little um, denomination merged with a very, very large denomination. We merged with the Methodist Church. And because of that merger, we became the United Methodist. And you'll see that term today, United Methodist. <clears throat> For us as a family, this was a, a bad turn of events. It was kind of disheartening because where our small group had been kind of Bible focused, <laughs> At that time, in its late 60s, early 70s, there's a lot going on in the world, from civil rights to Vietnam. And the United Methodists were a very activist group of people, group of Christians. They were very heavily involved in things like civil rights. They were very heavily involved in things like Vietnam. And my dad used to say he would come home every Sunday and he would be very disgusted. And he would say, you know, I might as well stayed home and read the Rockford Register Star because they preached right out of the Register Star. <laughs> and because of that, my parents kind of got disillusioned and they stopped attending. And they went many, many years unchurched, probably until their 50s or 60s, maybe probably 60s, before they went back to a church. And that whole time in my formative years, I was unchurched. And, you know, I look back on that now and I regret that. And I feel like, you know, that set me back in terms of my spiritual growth and spiritual development. I tell you all of that to say this. Unfortunately, I think the Christian world in general, the larger Christian world, if you will, has kind of over the last number of years fallen into that same trap. And I think about myself and I think about my struggle on social media. And I'll read something that is just blatantly untrue or ridiculous and I want to instantly make it right. I want to strike out. I want to set that person straight. I want to show them where their ignorance lies. And I see that happening more and more on social media and our world in general. <clears throat> and I see how divided we've come, we've become. We divide over everything. We divide over politics, Republican and Democrat. We divide over race. We divide even over gender. We certainly divide over religion. And 
I believe this world really needs us today. And that's where I've tried to turn this struggle into something positive, a forum where I can be encouraging, a forum where I can look for opportunities to share the good news. <clears throat> we all are appalled at the fact that the world we live in, the crime is so rampant, life in and of itself has so little meaning. I mean, from the big cities to Rockford to just about anywhere you go, you can pick up the morning paper and read about the number of shootings and the number of deaths. I'm tempted to say the world needs us now more than ever. But that wouldn't be true. Because there's always been sin in the world. There's always been problems. Um, you know, go back to the roaring 20s and the gangsters and machine guns and you name it. We just are in a time that we relate to, that we see. And the world, I believe, needs the church. The world um, needs Jesus. And we're the vehicle to bring Jesus to the world. But for many of us, me included, We've gotten caught up in the world, and we're wanting to be a part of the world, and we need to be more reflective of what it means to be a Christian in this world. I just want to share with you some scriptures that I believe should give us the proper focus to live lives today as Jesus would have us to live and for us to make a difference in this world. I believe we can make a difference in this world, that, that Jesus can make a difference in this world, but it, we are the legs and the feet and the, and the arms and the hands and the mouth of the Savior. I want to look at Philippians. 3 verses 15 through 21 Philippians 3 15 through 21 all of us then who are mature who are mature should take such a view of things and if on some point you think differently that too God will make clear to you let us live up to what we have already attained Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and tell you again, even through tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under, the, under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. The, the part that really strikes me in that scripture is the part that says our citizenship is not of this world. I'm a proud and patriotic citizen of the United States of America, but my true citizenship is in heaven. I am to be above this world. I am to be above the frame of this world and I am to view my citizenship and therefore my actions as part 
of a better place, a part that we all long to get to, and that is heaven. I'm going to also look at Romans 13, 1 and 2, the scripture that was read this morning. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those, to, uh, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. That one I've really struggled with. Because politicians, I don't care if you're a Republican or you're a Democrat, they all can be, they're all, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> they're all not what they should be. And I don't care, pick a side, they're all the same, okay? Um, and so whether I'm bashing Joe Biden because it's obvious he's lost his mind, <laughs> or whether I'm bashing Donald Trump because he's a vile person, I am rebelling against the authority that God has put in place. So I struggle with that one. I have to consciously keep that in mind and be God's representative whether I'm out in the public square or whether I'm on social media, um, that is my calling. Yeah. <clears throat> Matthew 22, 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid a plan to trap him with his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me a coin that's used to pay the taxes. And they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose image is this? Whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him, and they went away. I love that one. I spent a fair amount of time the last few years studying the Jewishness of Jesus. Because I don't think you can truly understand Jew, uh, Jesus until you understand his Jewishness. <laughs> what he did there was not only teach them a lesson and us, you know, pay your taxes, do the things you have to do, but again, your citizenship is in heaven, and therefore give unto God what belongs to God. But he's really slapping the Pharisees in the face. And I absolutely love it when Jesus slaps the Pharisees in the face. These are the guys that are setting the rules. That are saying, you can't get your cow out of the hole or the ditch on the Sabbath, because that's work and you can't do work on the Sabbath. And he says, reach in your pocket and take out a coin. So they do. He says, whose image is on that coin? It's Caesar's. Aren't you the guys that would say we are to have no graven images before us, yet you carry Caesar's image in your pocket. I love it when he slaps him upside the head. And he does it frequently. 
Titus 3, 1 through 11. Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient and ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one and to be peaceful and considerate and to always be gentle towards everyone. At one time we were foolish and disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. And when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of our righteousness, because of righteous things that we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of the rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having a hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have been trusted in God, those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because they are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, warn them a second time, and then have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and are self-condemned. Written 2,000 years ago in uh, pretty poignant and applicable to today. First Peter 2, 11 through 17, the gist of which is to um, submit yourself to authorities, whether they're the governor or the emperor, um, and to do no wrong to anyone and concentrate on doing right. Um, one that really stands out to me, I had the pleasure of teaching a class on First Peter. And if, if you remember, First Peter is about Christians who were under persecution and they were driven out of Jerusalem. It's called the dispersion. And I don't remember whether it was the first or the second dispersion because there were two dispersions. And it basically was God's way and God's will to take the good news into all the world because the Christians were driven out of Jerusalem, and so they had to go elsewhere to seek a place to live, to seek refuge. So in the very beginning of First Peter, Peter tells them that you are refugees. You are... Um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but that you have been scattered. You are taking the good news throughout the world. And in spite of your persecution, live such a way that when people look at you, they ask you, what is the reason for the hope that is within you? So here they are physically driven from their homes. They're persecuted. They're um, treated badly. They're treated like foreigners because that's exactly what they were. And yet Peter tells them, live such a good life that when people look at you, they scratch their head. They want to know what in the world are you doing? In today's terms, they might say, what in the world are you smoking? <laughs> because you have this joy you have this joy despite the things around you, mm -hmm. despite the mistreatment. That's our calling. That's, right. That's where we are to be. And again, I think the world needs Jesus, and I think we are the vehicle 
to bring Jesus to the world. Basically, I could go on. I have scriptures from Matthew 28. We all know is the Great Commission where our marching orders <clears throat> are set forth. Go into all the world and preach the good news and bring salvation to everyone. It's really hard to preach the good news and to bring salvation to everyone when you're known as the Facebook bully, when you're known as somebody who thinks they're superior, who always corrects someone, who always slaps someone. And again, it doesn't have to be on social media. It can be in the workplace. It can be anywhere. It could be in the body. But our calling is to take the good news into all the world. Matthew 9 reminds us that the harvest is plentiful, it's huge, it's bountiful, but the workers are few. So we need to be one of those workers. We need to help bring in that harvest. I could go on and on. I have a laundry list of things that Jesus would want his followers to do in a divided world. But I think hopefully you get the point. We are to live above our everyday lives. We are to live with our calling. We have confessed Jesus and we claim to represent him. And we will sit on the judgment seat before him. And he will take account of what we've done in this life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be one of those people who says, wait a minute, Lord, Lord, when did I do that? I want to be one of those who hears the words, well done, enter in, good and faithful servant. Thank you. Amen.